It's March. We're in a giant shed <coughs> full of sheep. And we're bound to be upstage by cute little lambs like this. All of which can just mean one thing. Lambing Live, Live is, is back. Welcome to Lambing Live and Lambing Live, it certainly is. Behind me here in this pen, you are looking at two very, very new lambs that were literally born in the last couple of minutes. This really is a celebration and we hope an insight into the busiest time in the sheep farmers year all over Britain. Right at this moment, 77,000 sheep farmers are sleepless and having frantic days in preparation for the arrival of roughly 16 million lambs. And this farm is no exception. I'm up in Scotland and this shed is basically a giant maternity ward all the ewes in here are expected to give birth probably during the next four days when we're on air and we will be following all the natural drama that that entails i'm just going to have a very quick scan round and see if anything is looking close to giving birth we will of course be keeping an eye on them throughout this next hour and for the 24 hours until the series ends on Friday night. Now before we concentrate on the sheep, I'd like to show you a little bit around the farm. So this is the main lambing shed here. And then if I jump outside, you may be able to make out, and I think what the Scottish call the gloaming, um, but the fields out there are actually where the ewes are turned out during the day. It's very good for them to be able to go out, have some fresh air, a little bit of exercise, and some nice green grass. And then they come in at night, and we'll learn a little bit more about why we do that later on in the programme. Now over here, uh, beautifully lit up, is the farmhouse, looking a little bit abandoned at the moment. A lot of farmhouses are feeling rather abandoned at the moment, as most of the families have moved lock, stock and barrel into their lambing sheds to constantly keep an eye on their pregnant ewes. Now, above me here, uh, another giant shed. We can just get a glimpse of some of the cattle. Uh, these are scimitar cattle, and we'll be meeting them a little bit later on in the series. And at the end, another very important shed. That is the nursery, where the lambs go when they're a little bit older. Now, this farm is owned and run by a family called the Dykes, brave souls who've agreed to be our hosts for this series of Lambing Live. Let's meet them. I've climbed up the slopes of Mendic Hill to give us the most fantastic view of this glorious borderland country and also of the Dykes family farm nestled just below me down there. Hamish and Susie are the third generation to farm here. They work a thousand acres of land in the shadow of the Pentland Hills, including the steep slopes of Mendic. Together they have 1,000 sheep of seven different breeds, 75 cows, eight highland ponies, four dogs, and two very boisterous ferrets. And of course, it's home to the whole Dykes family. I am Hamish Dykes. This is my wife, Susie Dykes, and our two children, Murdo and Rosie. And over here, we have my parents, Kate Dykes and John Dykes. Hamish has worked on the farm all his life, but recently Susie has come to help him full time. Marriage for how many years, Hamish? <laughs> Forty. <laughs> <laughs> for the Dykes, farming is a way of life. It's not just a job that you go to in the morning and earn a wage and come home at night. This is home, this is our life. Maybe I own the farm, but I don't regard it as owning it as such. I'm here for a short time and I have the duty of care. I have the duty of care to look after it and then pass it on. 
Susie grew up on an arable farm, but she trained as a veterinary nurse and loves her new role as sheep feeding technician. Probably not for everyone, or everyone would be doing it, I'm sure. <laughs> we are incredibly lucky where we live. We're in a beautiful community, a beautiful countryside, and we enjoy what we do, genuinely love what we do. So we wouldn't swap it for anything. No. <laughs> Hamish and Susie live in the old farmhouse at the very heart of the farm. With seven-year-old Murdo and nine-year-old Rosie. <laughs> Try taking a smaller bite, Rosie. I think you better wipe your face, mister, please. Off you go. <laughs> Hamish's parents live just over the road. This is my patch where I can do my own thing, since I'm not, uh, I'm retiring age, but I'm not retired. <laughs> John and Kate take great joy in also breeding pedigree Highland ponies. Whoa, 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 whoa. She's only coming four year old. This will be her first baby. But Hamish's soft spot is for his dogs, Doog and Jess. They're New Zealand hunterways, sheepdogs that use their bark to drive the sheep. Speak up. Being a farmer could perhaps be a remote or lonely life. But the dykes have strong ties to the people around them. And Hamish plays in the village pipe band. A real local favorite. The community spirit here is, is brilliant, and the, the older I get, the more I appreciate it, I think. Joining other farmers, friends and family strengthens bonds needed for life back on the farm. You scrub up rather well, don't you? <laughs> Not looking too bad yourself, Kate. <laughs> I'm absolutely filthy, as ever. <laughs> well, I'm joined now, of course, by Hamish Dykes. Thank you so much for letting us be here at, I know, what is an incredibly busy and can be quite a stressful time for, for sheep farmers. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to have you all here and uh, we're enjoying the experience. Well, we're here with, um, I've said, very expectant news. I mean, how expectant are they? Could we uh, expect to see lambs born tonight? Yeah, well, in theory, all these sheep in here should all lamb within the next sort of six days. So, so we're getting perhaps 30 sheep a day lambing. So we just missed one 20 minutes ago. I know. And uh, I think there's another one over there just thinking about starting. So I'd be quite hopeful that we'll get something in the next hour. Well, I would like to get our viewers involved in uh, making sure that we don't miss any lambing. So right. um, we've put together a little package um, of kind of signs of labour. So Hamish, if you could just talk us through what people need to look for. Well, here's a classic example. There's a sheep in the shed, obviously and she's pacing around and scratching at the straw, which is what they do, and they're up and down and very restless. And then there's the, the sort of licking of the lips as well. And then finally, there's this position that they get into with the back leg spread out. And, the, and that top lip going up. The top lip curling up just as she's starting to go into contractions. But these, that's a classic sign. You can see these signs from a few hundred yards away, you can spy sheep like that up the field, starting uh, to lamb. They'll quite often take themselves out of the main flock as well, won't they? Well, hopefully they do go and find themselves a quiet corner, but occasionally you get two sheep at the same time go to the same quiet corner, and that can cause muddle-ups. Well, let's use our... We've got a camera jib uh, arm here that can sweep up over the sheep um, and see if uh, anyone can spot anything that might be looking like it's in labour. Oh, we'll be keeping an eye on them. But what I'm interested in, Hamish, is, you know, I said that the sheep go out during the day. Why do you bring them in at night? We bring them in at night so that we can monitor them and keep an eye on them. Yeah. Um, you're protecting them against predators, you're protecting them against the weather, and you're able to assist with any 
assisting that is required. And then once they've given birth, you put them in these smaller pens. Now, this lovely set of triplets um, were actually born about half an hour ago. Um, why do you then separate them into these smaller pens? Well, if they were outside in the field and were away in a quiet corner, as we said, they would be fine to be left until the lambs were up and suckled. But in a shed here where it's as busy as it is, if you left them all running around loose, there would be all sorts of muddle-ups. So in here, it gives the lambs a chance to bond with their mother and their mother only. So it's a nice sort of... It is the equivalent of a nice, quiet, private corner for them to get on with bonding. It's a private maternity suite, yes, yeah, exactly. No expense spared for your sheep. Favorite. Absolutely not. Now, um, sheep do have a habit of giving birth um, at awkward times of the day and especially the night. Now, you have Alistair who comes in and helps you uh, with the night lambing and he was here last night and at 3 o'clock in the morning, he... Well, I mean, this sheep didn't wait for him. Uh, she gave birth incredibly quickly as you can see there um, and she was expecting triplets um, and as you can see the second one came along actually quite a long time afterwards there can be quite a big gap can't there? yeah I don't think there's any rhyme or reason maybe the older sheep in general tend to spit them out a bit quicker but uh, it varies and then we can see those classic labor signs again as she's about to give birth to the third Alistair just reaches in just to give her a final little helping yeah, hand. Yeah, I mean, there was no assist necessarily required there, but because he's there, just make sure it's out and up and breathing and doesn't, doesn't die. Doesn't die, yeah. exactly. And uh, die they didn't. Um, here you can see that ewe um, with only two lambs. Um, so what happened to the third, Hamish? Well, this ewe was scanned for three, as you can see, so she had three. When you say scanned for three, you do scanning exactly like... Um, mothers, don't you? Yeah, ultrasound scanning. It, uh, it lets us know how many they're expecting and it lets us know from back in January how to feed them accordingly. Mm -hmm. Triplets get fed more and singles get fed less. So she's just got the two lambs. What did you do with the third? Yeah. Well, we don't tend to leave ewes with three lambs because they've only got two teats, so it's a hard job for her to nurse three. And we took her third lamb and yeah. took it over here. And this ewe with the blue on her back was scanned for a single. Yeah. And she had one lamb. So we can see Alistair taking the, the, the last born, so the newest born, um, to this ewe. She only had the one lamb. Yeah. Now I'm amazed. I thought adoptions were rather more complicated than that. Well, she's an old ewe, so she's quite motherly, and it tends to be easier with an older ewe. Ideally, you would try and get the spare lamb adopted on before she'd had her own one, or while she's having her own one. But to get it twinned on after she's had her own one is less likely to work. But because she had only just had it, right. and there was two lambs, both brand new, and worked, she was motherly, worked it's, it's worked fine. So we've got two lambs here and two lambs there, which the is perfect. perfect combination. Well, we'll be learning a little bit more about adoption later on in the series. But now let's join Adam with Hamish's wife, Susie, in the nursery. Well, we've seen those ewes going into the individual pens, Susie, but this is the sort of next stage in their life, isn't it? That's right. We call this the nursery. Um, they've been in little individual pens, close to their mums. They've learnt to know what she smells like, what she sounds like, and uh, hopefully now we've moved them up to a bigger pen, they can learn to find each other in a bigger group, not get lost. And what sort of age are they now, then? These guys would be born probably uh, a day ago, uh, yesterday and through the night previous night. So they're still very young yeah. and they've got to find their mums because she's the only one that will feed them, isn't she? Yeah, somebody else's mother's going to dump them away, not going to let them suck and um, if we send them out to the field not knowing where mum is, they'll soon perish. They can't survive out there without her so they need to know what they're doing. So is it all working well? Can you see some, some good examples? Yep, I think uh, this unit over here at the back at the wall, they're all very comfortable settling down for the night, bedtime stories. Um, all very happy. And if it goes wrong, if they can't find their mothers in here, what do you do? If that happened, we would um, pen them up again, put them together till they, they learn each other, um, not get anyone stressed out, take away all the other factors. And um, but sh normally at this stage, they're they're fine. They're 
Okay. It's incredible that maternal instinct, isn't it? How she can call her lambs in a crowd. I'm sure if you put lots of people together and mix them all up, they won't find their lambs as quick as these girls can. No, they? no, that's right. They, are, they all know their, each other's smell and sound. So, yeah, good. Now, one of our viewers has written in and wants to know. Her name is Rachel Chamberlain. She wants to know why they've got paint spray numbers on the side. Good question. Um, each brother and sister combination or uh, family siblings have uh, the same number painted on the sides so that we know uh, that they're a pair and then that's the family that's unit. the family unit yeah. now at home we put a paint spray number on the side of the u so we know that we've got the mother as well why don't you do that well um we used to have an old shepherd worked here years ago called alistair who's a great guy and someone said do you want me to write the number of the u on the side of the the number of the lambs on the side of the u and he said oh yes. So amateurish. <laughs> I'm a complete amateur then. Spray cans cost a lot of money and we're Scottish, so we can't be having that either. Goodness me. <laughs> well, it's all seemed to be very settled in here, all going well. Let's go back over to Kate and uh, see how they're getting on in the main barn. Thanks very much indeed, Adam. Well, um, Hamish is just checking on the ewes here. I'm going to leave them and take you to one of my favourite corners of the lambing shed. And this... Hello, Tiddlers! This is where the orphan lambs are kept, all looking actually quite sleepy and content, apart from, you come on then, if you're shouting, you better come and be on the telly. There we are. Um, now, we say orphan lambs, actually, most of these are not orphans. They have mums, um, but they're either triplets that haven't been able to be adopted on or their mums haven't got enough milk. Now, as Adam said, uh, viewers have been writing in with their questions, and you can too if you haven't done it yet. Uh, you can do it very easily by emailing us at lamminglive at bbc.co.uk. Now, of course, to have lambs like these, you need rams. And many sheep farmers view the beginning of their year as the ram sales, the annual ram sales that take part, place all over the country. I went to the Kelso ram sale with the dykes back in September. This is the Kelso ram sale, the world's biggest single day sheep auction. Show it, show it. More than 5,000 animals will be sold here today, all done up to look their finest. There are 16 different breeds in 14 auction rings. If you're a Scottish sheep farmer, this is a crucial day in the calendar. The dykes are here to sell 12 of their blue-faced Leicester rams. They do look magnificent. Presentations is half the job, really. Just before they get into the ring, they'll, they'll all get a, a face wipe and, and uh, trying to get any straws get off, off them. The and straws just off to, and things. OK, well, put me All the wee niggly things that girls do in front of the mirror just before they go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you noticed? Thank you. <laughs> But before they're sold, they have to undergo a breed inspection to check they're up to standard. So you check teeth, mm -hmm. you check testicles. Yes. One of my very favourite things on Lambing Live, I'm, I'm sorry, I know it's slightly perverted, but we are going to have a little, little check, just for old time's sake. <laughs> and those felt fine to me. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> John, happy? Nope. John, you are funny. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to be happy until about 20 past 10 when all these are sold, are you? I might not be happy then either. <laughs> Inspection passed, I help to give them a final wash and brush up before they head into the ring. No sheep for you today. Here we are. Good start from John and Hamish. Hamish and John are the first into the ring. Traditionally, this is the worst slot, and they're concerned that buyers might be unwilling to pay good prices this early in the day. Their first ram sells for a solid £720. Bidding is brisk. And Susie is happy with the prices. Not bad morning's work. Not bad morning's work. <laughs> I mean, the highest one, 950, lowest 500, so a reasonably consistent price. Even John seems satisfied. Yeah, it was all right. <laughs> Do you feel able to relax a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah. As much as I ever relax. <laughs> so 
are you now thinking about doing a bit of shopping yourself? Yes, it's always nice to get your own sheep sold first before you go shopping because... Well, you know what your budget is. You know what your budget is, yeah. <laughs> He's got a good mouth and he's got a good skin and he's, he's quite stretchy. Cheers, mate. Hamish is looking for a Texel ram he can put with his ewes to breed lambs for meat. You don't go for a Texel for facial beauty, do you? <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good long sheep. Yeah. Not quite got the backside that you would be hoping for, so it's the old adage trying to find something that's got everything. Yeah. That one there's catching my eye. <laughs> So it wouldn't surprise me if 80 was John's favourite, but uh, the way he's, the way he's <laughs> bringing it round there, here yeah. to the camera I would suggest <laughs> I might not be wrong with that. And it seems that his method of choosing a ram is a little more discerning than my own. Teeth more than testicles? Uh, well, you don't tend to find many tucks here that don't have a decent pair of testicles, to be yeah. quite honest. Yeah. Whereas you're far more likely to find some that have got substandard mouths. Right. And to be honest, look fairly good to me, don't they? You're, you, you, <laughs> you don't even need to grab them to know that they're, that they're... they're all there. Yeah. But that, for me, definitely is, would be my pick out of this pen. But window shopping is one thing. Getting this ram for the price he's got in mind is another. You're thinking maybe seven, eight? I think that's what he'll make. Right. I'm not totally sure that I'll spend that much on him. And sure enough, the price goes higher than Hamish is prepared to pay. Yeah, I didn't bother going in there because I think it would have gone six eighties, maybe heavy enough for the first for the yeah. first one. So we'll see. And the ones that you pick are the ones that you can't afford. <laughs> Another breeder's rams come in, and it's clear that Hamish has expensive taste when the price soon tops seven hundred pounds. Clearly, to get a good sheep out of this pen, you need to get a bit harder. But finally, his luck's in. <laughs> With a bid of six hundred and fifty pounds, Hamish gets the right ram at the right price. He's a good lengthy sheep, nice tight skin, and he's got quite a sweet head. So yeah. for the ewe lamb job, he should be good. And so, will it be his progeny that we hope to see being born in March? I do hope so. So we'll, I do we'll, hope, we'll see. I do whether hope whether his good... progeny will be being born in March. <laughs> So here's Hamish's dad, John. Hi, John. Hi, Adam. All quiet on the lambing pad at the moment? Well, I think there might be a few thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, in that sale, Hamish bought the Texel ram. How did he get on? The ram did very well, yes. Uh, some of his offspring was pro are probably being born tonight. Um, but, no, he was, he was a good buy, yeah. And your blue-faced Leicesters, they sold well, didn't they? They did, yes. Uh, we've, we kept up the, the, the same standard as last year, roughly. And we had uh, quite a few regular customers who came back again, so that was very satisfying. And now you've got the, the following crop of lambs that will be sold this autumn? Yes, uh, they're, uh, they've been evicted from inside to let the ewes in to lamb this time. And are you hoping for good prices again then? I think we've got a nice pen of lambs, a pen of rams anyway, they're not lambs anymore. Um, I think they're as good as the other ones were at this time last year, so uh, we'll live in hope. Now, your role has changed slightly and you've moved just across the road and you've got your own sort of farming going on over there with your blue-faced lesters. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's something that keeps me out of Hamish's hair across there. Let's have a look at some of the ewes there. You've got your, your blue-faced lester ewe there looking proudly down at her little lamb. They're a very different looking sheep, aren't they? Yeah, they're, they're uh, tall and, and elegant, some people would say, um, and uh, they cross very well with all the hill breeds. And these lambs are, are going to be quite valuable, aren't they, if they grow up as good rams? 
Well, the rams should be should be valuable anyway. That's why we live in hope, and, and um, the prices we get at Kelso is what keeps us going uh, for the next year. Um, but they can be quite tricky to look after, can't they, Blueface Lasters? Well, they don't have the benefit of hybrid vigour that the crossbreds do. Um, so yes, they take a, they do take a bit more looking after, and they have they have multiple births, which uh, makes it even more difficult. Keeping you busy. It keeps me out of mischief anyway. <laughs> well, thanks, John. Now then, of course, when it comes to lambing, you've got to get the ewes pregnant. So the gestation period of a sheep from mating to birth is five months. So the rams go in with the ewes five months ago. And that time of mating in sheep farming is called tupping. And the rams are often known as tups. So back in October, the Dykes family were busy getting their ewes ready with a little bit of help from a rookie shepherd called Kate Humble. It's early October, and I'm helping Hamish gather his ewes in, ready for tupping. Speak up. It's a chance for me to watch Hunterways, Doog and Jess in action. Very different style from a collie or a Welsh dog, and they do everything by barking. So there's no kind of running up and nipping at the heels or anything like that. They just stand behind and go, come on, woof, come on, move, woof. That'll do, that'll do, that'll do. These ewes need to have their version of an MOT to make sure they're in peak condition for the rams. My first job is to sort them into breed types so we can compare like with like. Texels and yep. mules, yeah? Yeah. So that one there that's a little bit speckly, is that, that Texel? That's a Texel, yeah. yeah. So yeah. mules straight on, mules texels straight on, into you. Texels to I would stand, I would stand, stand here that side. Yeah, okay. and let them pass you. That's the way to go. This feels like my kind of initiation oh. test, and it could all go very, very wrong. Two Texels to start with. I think you're a Texel, you're a mule. <laughs> Definitely got a mistake there, Hamish. Oh dear. Oh, steady, steady. I feel like I'm going to get marked at the end of this. We'll be counting the mistakes. Oh, for no. Sure. <laughs> no, there's one very obvious mistake over there. <laughs> and we've got that, that's couple. a mule there, yeah. Three, I think. Three. Hamish gives each you a health check to see if they might have worms. You run your hands up and down, you can feel the ribs on the side. Yeah. And you can feel the rib on top. Here, you run your hands up and down, and you can't really. There's less. Yeah. She, yeah, she's. She's much leaner, so that would suggest that she may have a worm burden. Right. Um, so we'll give her a, we'll give her a drench. Using what's known as a drench to get rid of conditions like worms and parasites means that the ewes are more likely to conceive and give birth to healthy lambs. So I'd say she's quite lean. She's not. She is. Every ewe also gets supplementary minerals in the form of two large tablets called boluses. Gillian, the dyke's shepherdess, demonstrates how it should be done. And then it's my turn. Okay. You have uh, the gun. So that, basically, you load it in there and put it right down the throat. Just, just over the, t the top of the tongue. Yeah. OK. Yeah. 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 Now, there's, there's two boluses. Yeah. And they both go in the gun at the same time. And it, they just slowly dissolve right. for six months. Basically, these minerals that are deficient in the ground, yeah. this is a way of replacing yeah. them. Yeah. It's a hell of a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> got to shove something like this. I mean, imagine. No wonder you don't really like the idea. Come on. Oh, dear. Oh, I can't <laughs> believe it. You could just drop them on the ground. They might pick them up and eat them themselves. <laughs> I can't help feeling I'm letting the side down. I think the, the secret is to hold the head up just really? for a little bit. A little while, bit longer. While they swallow. If you let the head drop too quickly, that's when they can spit them out. Yeah, that work? Brilliant. She was a bit slow to start with, I think, but she's got the hang of it now. Right, Jim, in about six hours we'll have this lot done. <laughs> but even though I have my own sheep and obviously I'm a lot more experienced now, it's still not instinctive. There's still so much I don't learn. I and mean, you watch Gillian, she just does it. It's like automatically click, click, click. Whoa! 
on. The final stage in the sheep MOT is a chemical bath to treat skin conditions. That's a fantastic medieval-looking tool you've got there. Handmade by my fair husband. Oh, really? Yes. I'm very impressed. Quality craftsmanship. Look at that. <laughs> so it, it shouldn't break. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what do I use this for? Well, you want to get the sheep's head in this bit and dunk it to make sure its head goes under. Right. Um, if you need to pull a sheep back, if it hasn't gone under and you want to pull it back, then you hook this bit round its neck and pull it back the okay. way with that. OK, OK. Here they come. Come on, girls, bath time. Woo! They're quite enthusiastic about it, actually, aren't they? No. It's basically like a kind of unruly children's swimming party. Yeah. Come on, girls. It's like bombs away! <laughs> Wow, this smells. I can't tell you this is not a pretty bubble bath. After their dip and a drip dry, the girls are ready for the rams. As soon as the ram goes in, they're like, yeah, boy, we're exactly, ready for yeah, you. They're ready. Desperate, as Susie <laughs> says. I tell you what, it's a <laughs> den of sexual iniquity up here in the borders. I thought you were all... Tell I wish. <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell his rubbish round here. <laughs> <laughs> She's incredibly enthusiastic, that humble, isn't she? She certainly is. <laughs> now, this is your first full year on the farm, isn't it? Because you had a, a job before. That's What's right. it been like? Fine so far, no major fallouts, no major disagreements. Um, Hamish doesn't shout too much, or he knows he'll only get beans on toast for tea as well. So. <laughs> and working on the farm all the time, living here and working with your husband, is that tricky at all? No, it's good. I like being here. It's nice to be involved and uh, just understand a bit better about what's going on on a daily basis and be here for the kids. Uh, it's all good. No, no complaints. Now, the cameras were with you early this morning and we uh, filmed you two doing a little bit of lambing. Yeah. Tell me what was going on here. This was sort of um, first thing this morning. Um, Hamish noticed this ewe was... She had sort of stopped pressing and, and started eating hay again and uh, he was slightly concerned that there was an issue so we caught her up and sure enough he was uh, presented with a lamb coming backwards, he could just feel the tail coming out. So, and that um, was born, stillborn, born yes, dead? Yes, sadly that one died. So he then lambed the second one which was alive and very well. So happy story there, we ended up getting two live lambs from that. Wonderful. And so there she is licking it. Which, so. You know, that death of lambs is something that is something that, you know, it's life and death in the lambing pen, isn't Sadly it? Sadly really? it is, it is. Um, and obviously you don't want to lose any, but it happens. Um, the nice thing about that is she was a triplet and had Hamish not pulled the first one out, we would have lost all three of them. So at least we managed to salvage two. And here she is with here her is. two little lambs. Yeah. And they're looking well, aren't they? They are. They look quite content now. Quite... Now, one little trick, although it sounds, seems a bit mean, I quite like to get one up. And if they get up, and uh, or you lift them up and they have a nice stretch that means they're lovely and healthy so look, look at that oh Ooh, yes yeah, big stretch so <laughs> she's mothering them well they're full of milk and uh, everything's tickety boo but it's been a busy start for you hasn't it has it has been busy yeah but we're uh, everything's going well at the minute the weather's been good and everything's fine so good well Lovely Susie here. She's uh, busy working on the farm for the first year, really hectic lambing. And on top of that, we've been following you around with the cameras, haven't we? Yeah. So take a look at the first instalment of her video diary. It's early autumn, the beginning of the sheep farming year, and my first year as a full-time farmer. We've been busy getting the ewes ready to be put in with the rams and the horns of our Scottish black-faced sheep are leaving me black and blue. It's my thighs that get it. Just the corners of these just get me here. <laughs> Hamish is working really hard today. He's gone to take four, four <laughs> sheep to market. <laughs> Meanwhile, 350 miles away in Wales, some very special sheep are getting ready to join our flock. My lovely husband has decided to buy two badger-faced rams bred by our trainee shepherdess, Kate Humble. We've never had sheep like this on the farm before. They're a hardy breed, named for their distinctive markings. That's it. Oh, boy. I 
I'm not sure what they'll make of their new home in Scotland. Are you proud? <laughs> the children have taken to the Welsh boys. The one with the woolly chest is Owen and the other one's Ivor. But Shrek, our Icelandic Berishong ram, isn't quite so welcoming. These guys are ready for work judging by the way that they're behaving with each other. Asserting their authority. <laughs> we try and distract them with some young ladies that might help. Ivor and Owen are on a blind date with 150 of our young ewes that we call hogs. These are sheep still in their first year that will be first time mums. Anything we get from them is a bonus. We use smaller rams to give them smaller lambs. Ivor and Owen have a lot to prove. Like the hogs, it's their first time in action. We need to see how they're getting on. So every six days, we round them up. You just want the boys in here. Just the boys. The ones with the horns. Oh, yes. Dear. They've still got a lot of fighting spirit in them. <laughs> and now that we've taken them away from the girls again, these guys have started fighting again. So. Scotland versus Wales. <laughs> I'm hoping Susie's going to go in there and change the cranes now. <laughs> <laughs> This here is the crane. When the ram jumps a female, it leaves a mark on the backside of the sheep, just there. Because this one's fairly well worn, so he's obviously been doing some work. And we're now going to replace it with a different colour so that the sheep in the next six days get a red mark on the backside. And then come lambing time, we will have a fairly good idea who's going to lamb when. So we're just going to let these back out with the girls. We can paint the town red, so to speak. Go forth and multiply. Hopefully, we'll be seeing lots of red marks in this field very soon. Well, I have to say, your Icelandic tut wasn't very welcoming to my boys. <laughs> It was very bad behaviour. I do apologise. <laughs> See what you did to us in the Six Nations. <laughs> <laughs> but is that typical when they're, when they're kind of bloods up, when the testosterone's up? Do they kind of effectively rut almost like deer? They do, and they're probably more prone to it at that time of year, just before mating time. Um, it's just, just like the deer, yeah. And they also um, display some quite sort of um, distinctive behaviour when they do meet the ewes for the first time. I mean, it is sort of foreplay, isn't it? It is really, yes. When you put the rams in with the ewes, they'll walk around and, and sniff them and smell them to see whether they're in season. And here you can see a ram with his top lip up. They've got a gland under their top lip and they can scent whether the ewe is in season, whether she's ready to accept the ram or not. And uh, they'll actually touch her with her front leg as well. It's not and... terribly romantic, really, is it? It'll give her a bit of a kick, see if she's up for it. <laughs> and if she's ready, it, she'll just stand for him. If she's not, she'll walk away. And, uh, you know, there you can see the ram doing the business and everybody's happy, hopefully, lambs in the spring. Yeah, you're hoping. Uh, well, the, the boys did perform, I think, didn't they? Well, they certainly acted like they were performing. Well, we'll, so. we'll, we'll be finding out how we'll see the results of the scanning in tomorrow's programme and hopefully we may even see some lambs this week. But um, I've been lambing at home, my purebred badgers, and just to give you a, a little bit of insight into what you might be expecting, here are some of my lambs that were born in the last couple of weeks. What do you think, Adam? Well, I think they look absolutely lovely. Quite skillful spray work there, Kate. <laughs> Thank 
you. I think I think Susie would be very cross with my wasteful use of spray, but <laughs> I'm I'm quite pleased with my lambs. So only only 16 was my mm. my uh, top figure, but um, what do you think? If you had lambs looking like that, would it be a disaster? Uh, no, I don't think it'd be a disaster. <laughs> might be the only badger face Welsh mountain sheep in the borders, right? <laughs> yes, enough, it, but, might. Uh... it might. Well, um, hopefully, as I say, the boys have have done you proud, and uh, we'll see the results a little bit later on. I can't believe you've been flogging him rams. It's unbelievable. Taking a leaf out of your book, Henson. <laughs> now then, there are more sheep in Scotland than there are people. And a couple of months ago, I went to see two very passionate farmers who keep the breeds that dominate, and they are remarkable sheep. It was lovely to see them. Here in the north of Scotland, over 200 years ago, the land would have been farmed by smallholders with a couple of cows and a handful of small primitive sheep. Then came the clearances. Big estate owners saw an opportunity to make their land more profitable, so moved people off to make way for sheep. The first to arrive were the Cheviots. Highly prized for their wool, they were brought up from the hills on the English border. Armadale Estate on the north coast was one of the first to be settled by the Cheviot. Pretty tough existence up here, isn't it? Can be in the winter, yes, but it's, it's nice too in the summer. It's, it can be quite bonny. This pedigree flock is now raised by Joyce Campbell. Nice and quiet, aren't they? But getting right up on the cliffs there. Yeah, quite. they're quite settled there, yes. They'll, they'll make a living. That's the guys working in heather and rough ground there. Interesting, you know, yes. you say make a living. I mean, they're a productive animal, aren't they? Yes, they have to make the best of the terrain they're in, and they'll do that. The Cheviots had to toughen up for their new lives in the Highlands. Come by! Over time, they adapted, and today's hill Cheviots are ideally suited to the rough ground. Up behind, good girl. Joyce's flock roams over five and a half thousand acres. And to get a closer look, I'm going to have to catch one. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well done. They're strong well sheep, aren't they? Let me just sit down. You want a lambing Just job? sit her down there. Oh. Have I caught a good one? She's quite good, yes. Her nose can be blacker, but she's not okay. bad. Good skin. Skin being the wool? Yes, the wool. What I like, it springs back on you. Do you feel the density of that? It's quite fine for a hill breed, it isn't is it? It's nice, quite a nice um, fibre in it, yes. You can understand why they wanted them for their wool. You can see. And here we are in the midst of winter, and she's in good condition, she isn't is, she? She is, yeah. Good bum on her, good jig, it's her yeah, bum. Yeah, that's where you the leg of lamb is. That's the leg of lamb there. It's a tasty bit. Whoa! <laughs> It's like a gazelle. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the, the hair on the face? Well, I like them to be nice and smooth and silky and milky. They're better milkers when they've got nice hair on them. Silky so, and smooth, they produce more milk. Well, that's what I find. You know this breed inside out, don't you? Yes. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> I love them. They're my whole way of life. You have to live with them all your days. You have to look like what you're looking at every morning when you go out. Like your wife. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Just... The Cheviot is still valued for its meat and fleece, but back in the early 19th century, it fell out of popularity when wool prices dropped. It was time for a new sheep to enter the arena. In came the Scottish Blackface. This is now the most common pure breed of sheep, not only in Scotland, but across the whole of the UK. Robert Kay works a pedigree flock of more than a thousand Scottish black faces on his family farm in Ayrshire. So how do you check an animal? It takes a wee while. <laughs> <laughs> like the Cheviot, the Scottish blackface can fend for itself in harsh conditions. But every day, Robert likes to check on his favourites. Can you recognise individuals? Oh yeah, just like you know people's faces, you remember their names, it's just the same. So you love them as a breed? Yeah. Brought up with them, grew up with them, so I just love them to bits. The Kay family are award winning breeders, and Robert knows exactly what makes a good blackface. A Scottish blackface ewe it needs to have good shape, good thickness, a leg in each corner, and good wide back, a good thick muzzle, 
Good broad there, and right broad brew on her. Brew? Brew. Oh, like a brow. Brew. Like a yeah. forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Good wide brew. And the colour of the face? Could be black, or some of them have white bits in the face. Doesn't matter, it's just preference. And what about the horns? Nice cast of horns. Nice and wide. Nice and wide, yep. And why is it this colour? Well, these ones are for stock judging tonight, so we'll just put a wee bit of colour on them for show. Just to sort of make them look a bit smarter, stand them out a bit. Yep. Get them ready for a night out. Tonight is the biggest social event in the Scottish blackface calendar, and Robert's got to get his girls looking their best. So after a quick wash and brush up, they're ready to go. Uh, I've come to enter here. There's my fiver. Stock judging is a bit of fun. Families from far and wide have come to take part. The idea is to rank the four sheep in your order of preference and try to match what the official judge thinks. A bit like sheep bingo. I feel a bit nervous, actually. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's a bit of pressure. OK, all right, concentrate, Adam. There we go. I'm trying to remember all the things he told me. Broad muzzle. Yep. Nice wide sheep. Sheep. All the way down. Good shape. Alert. Yep. I like the skin of red, but I prefer the body and the look of the yellow one. I think so. Yeah. The sheep are identified by different coloured tape on their horns. These colours are then abbreviated for the score sheet. So red tape A. Red tape A. Blue tape. Blue B. Blank is X and yellow is Y. Yep. OK. This is very difficult. It's a harder than you thought. <laughs> Y, H, and D. I got B right. B right. But I put the old boy Y in last, and he put it second. I know. What does he? He doesn't know what he's talking about, this man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a great start, but my chances should improve now Robert's girls are in the ring. I'm determined to get one lot right. We get at this team. <laughs> yeah, they're looking well. I really like them, and that little you is a lovely, isn't she? She's a cracker of a you. She's but just, I've, I've put her last. I've got last as well, Adam, but she could just do me a couple inches bigger. Yeah, she's just not quite right, there, is she? Yep. Right. Official for this class is A, B, Y, and X. I got the last one right, that's all. I got the first one right, and the last one right, just the middle two. <laughs> Even Robert didn't place his sheep in the same order as the judge. In my books, you're not doing too well at the moment. You could try and step up to the mark a bit more. No, but I'm doing really well in my room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With so much variation in the blackies, I think it all comes down to the judge's personal preference and a bit of luck. B Y D D. Yes! Oh. <laughs> I got one. <laughs> You're learning, you're getting better at this, I can tell. You're coming around to my way of thinking. <laughs> you are shamelessly competitive. <laughs> I know, ridiculous, wasn't it? You'll never make a judge, though. No, it's really quite difficult. Yeah, clearly, and, and very subjective, I guess, in it a way. It is. I mean, it's, you know, down to the judge's choice, like it is in proper judging out in the show ring. Yeah, yeah. Um, fascinating stuff, though. Absolutely fascinating. Now, um, some of you have already been emailing in your questions to Lambing Live at bbc.co.uk, including Beatrice Smith, um, and she wanted to know about Humble the Lamb and how is she, how is she getting on. Well, you may remember uh, back in the first series, I certainly could never forget when I delivered my very first lamb. What you're going to feel, if you slide your fingers in very carefully, can you see the, the one foot, you can feel another foot next to it. If you can get hold of those two legs and just yeah. very gently pull slowly down. Do I need to support the head? Or yeah. that just very, it'll just slip out, that's it, just keep pulling down, that's it. Now you just carry on pulling all the way around, right to the front and show mum. Yeah. That's it. Turn it the right way around. And there I was with my ever patient teacher, the wonderful Kate Bevan. You and did a it great was job. Just, well, it's, do you ever get bored of it? I don't. I, you know, corny as it may sound, I have seen thousands of lambs born. 
and everyone is special. You know, it's an amazing moment, isn't it? It really is an amazing moment. I will never forget it. But as to Humble the Lamb, which that lamb was named, thanks to the Bevans, um, she didn't turn out terribly well, did she? No, I have to put a disclaimer in for you. It wasn't your fault, but Thank I'm you. afraid the lamb was a little bit wonky and it couldn't keep up with its brother and its mother, so it became a pet lamb during the series. We bottle-fed it and live on television on the last show, Kate turned to me and said, Adam, a little humble, I'd love to keep her, but uh, I haven't got any sheep at home. Will you look yeah. after her until I get my own sheep? So now I have her back on my farm. <laughs> I've still got her. How many years ago was that? Uh, about four years ago, I think. And here she is. Uh, this was uh, Humble, filmed just last week. I was actually up to see her as well. Um, but looking a little different, Adam. She is. She's still got a black head and her body has gone silver. But when you look at her walking, she's still quite wonky. Yeah. Um, so we haven't been brave enough to put her in lamb. And she's just a pet. And I just keep her for you. Would you like a bag? Thank you. Not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> but there you are, Beatrice. She's doing very well indeed. Now, we've just got time for one more. I like, actually, this is a great question that came in from Josh William in Northern Ireland. He wanted to ask whether it was true if ewes can actually abort their lambs before, you know, obviously before they, they lamb them, um, if they're threatened. Well, in a situation like this, we're not causing any problems working around the sheep. Um, so you can work amongst them, but if you chase them a lot when they're yeah. heavily pregnant out in the fields, and um, particularly if a dog gets up behind them, yes, then that can cause serious problems. So that's why it's so important at this time of year, if you do have dogs like me, absolutely obsessed with my dogs, do put them on a lead when you're going through fields full of sheep. They may not be used in lamb, but the likelihood at this time of year is that they will. Um, we'll keep your questions coming in to Lambing Live at bbc.co.uk. We've got three more days to answer them. Um, but in the meantime, back in the autumn, the time came for the Texel ram that Hamish bought at Kelso to be put to the test. Would he prove a good investment or would he be rather, well, good mouth and no testicles? <laughs> By late October, it's time for tupping to start in earnest. Before our rams meet the ewes, there's one last job to do. Round up what we call the teasers. These tups are vasectomised tups. They've not got the ability to make lambs anymore, so they've had an operation and uh, live a very carefree life now. The teaser's job is to get the ewes ready to breed. It kick-starts their hormones and gets them ovulating. The idea is that they'll fall pregnant more easily when the real rams take over. Well, these guys have a fairly blessed life. They have no results to prove themselves, no offspring to answer for, and they tend to live for quite a long time as well. The teaser's job is done for this year, so we're taking them out to make way for the rams. With over a thousand ewes and three different types of sheep on the farm, we work hard to make sure we'll have enough lambs come springtime. This is the ram that we bought at Kelso, the Texel. Quite pleased with him, but I just happened to notice that his feet aren't just as good as they might be. They're just a little bit overgrown. As long as I do everything I can, I can't blame myself for it. Hopefully he'll go and do a job for three weeks and get everybody in lamb. A lot is riding on these rams, so it can be an anxious time. You just hope that the, the tups are going to go out and, and do what they're needed to do now, and that's just a leap of faith, really, in nature. You can't do anything about that. You've just got to hope they know what they're up to. <laughs> the tup's a vital part. You've got one tup for 50 ewes is the sort of general rule of thumb. One ewe wrong is a couple of lambs missed. One tup wrong is potentially 100 lambs missed. Our new Texel is going in with our mule ewes. His job is to help them produce meaty lambs for the table. Well, the boy from Kelso seems to know what he's doing anyway. I'm not quite sure if that was a direct hit, but certainly close to target. So this is the beginning of the year for a sheep, really. The, the tups are going out and basically we're, we're sowing our crop in a manner of speaking. Hopefully we'll get a good crop of lambs. By Halloween, all the work on the farm is geared towards tupping. But sometimes you need a break from sheep. Which animal needs rescuing the most, do you think? A ghost. With jaggy teeth, won't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Amazing! And it's quite easy to tell 
tak sebut. The rams are working hard, and as autumn rolls on, it's starting to show. The Kelso ram has been getting a lot of exercise. They've lost a little bit of condition because you can see their belts are needing tightening a hole or two. Tweak that off and change the crayon on it. The harnesses on our rams are used to hold crayons, so they leave a mark on every ewe they mate with. You can see it working here on these ewes, so any green mark that you can see of these ewes is a result of having been mated with the tup. Absolutely no concerns with this field whatsoever. Every ram on the farm needs to be checked and the crayon changed every six days, so it's all hands on deck. We're catching a tup each here because there's three tups, so Hamish and I will catch one each and then there'll be one left over. The last person to catch their first tup has to catch, catch the, the third one. one. All right. All right, OK. <laughs> Hamish started playing rugby uh, probably at college and he enjoys a good scrap, I think. <laughs> And uh, he's certainly a lot quicker than I am at uh, rugby tackling things. Stay with us, Susie. Wasn't very elegant. You was all right? It? Oh, he was just first. <laughs> I'll catch the second lamb if we need to. But this is your typical Beltex ram. So they're much, much smaller than any of the other breeds. Oh, botherations. It's really quite remarkable that a ram this size is able to mate use that size because these are big, big sheep. But the Beltex breeders all tell me that it's amazing what they can do on their tippy toes. And there is quite a lot of green on the back end of these sheep, so. Something must be working. Can you chuck me a crayon, Sorry, please? I don't think they make harnesses small enough for these sheep. Oh, God, she's got bad breath. <laughs> two down, one to go. Hamish is only too happy to test his rugby skills a second time. We'll just have to wait until lambing to see if all our weeks of hard work have paid off. Tell you what, Susie, I am impressed by your ram wrangling skills. <laughs> They're both so strong. <laughs> but also, those Beltex rams, it's like trying to catch a greased pig, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> There's no hair to hang on to. <laughs> job. Uh, now, we're back in the main shed. Uh, frustratingly, I mean, there's lots showing little signs, Hamish. There are quite a few that look fairly imminent, yeah. but uh, yeah. we're going to have to go some in the next three minutes. We're going to see any live this evening, I'm afraid. <laughs> and some little lambs that are looking very sleepy indeed are the orphan lambs that are curled up, looking absolutely adorable in a great big pile. Um, but we will be here throughout the night so uh, we won't miss anything and you will see all the action from the lambing shed if you join us again tomorrow night we've also got some lovely other stories for you including we're going to be meeting the dykes cattle and finding out whether their bulls made the grade at the sterling cattle stale and I'll be in search of the elusive mouflon which is one of the ancestors of all British sheep and I have a go at curling. Now, all I can say is that if I had been on the team at Sochi, things would have been very different indeed. I have no dignity left at all. <laughs> that was hopeless. <laughs> it was a little hopeless, but all I can say is just try it. It was absolutely <laughs> exhausting. So we will be back here at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. As I say, we won't be leaving the shed, so you'll be assured of plenty of action. We'll look forward to seeing you then. A very good night. Bye. Good night. Goodbye. Good night. Good night.
long before Scotland and England. 